Good afternoon. My name is Robert Lustig. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of California, San Francisco, and we are convening a panel here at the uh, Sugar, Stress, Environment, and Weight uh, Symposium sponsored at, here at UCLA on food insecurity. Uh, here, uh, we, uh, my colleagues will introduce each of themselves and we are going to talk about the elephant in the room, the role of industry in food insecurity, what's gone on, and what we're going to do about it. So please, Kristen. My name is Kristen Kearns. I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco. And I have been studying the organizational behavior of food industry trade groups, particularly the Sugar Association, which represents the cane and beet sugar industry. Hi, I'm Brianna Hawkins. I'm a policy director with the LA Food Policy Council. We're a collective impact initiative working to promote nutrition, um, address food insecurity, and promote sustainable food production in the Los Angeles region. And I'm Kelly Brownell, the dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. Uh, and I'm also the director of a newly created World Food Policy Center there. So we have a, uh, an eminently competent and qualified team to discuss the role of industry. The problem, of course, is that there's nobody from industry here. So we'll get to call the shots for a change. Um, Kelly, in all of your work uh, up till now, you have spent a tremendous amount of time calling out big food as being part of the problem. Have you seen any response on their part in terms of accepting any culpability and uh, ultimately making any changes in terms of products, in terms of reformulation, in terms of altering marketing to children, anything at all that we can hang our hat on as to the fact that they're uh, on board? Well, if one issue, first off, is who are we talking about when we say the words food industry? Because, of course, there are a vast number of players there. There are little mom-and-pop markets on the corner, and there are massive agribusiness companies that span the world. But in this context, who we're generally talking about are the big food processing companies. Um, you know, the, the Coca-Colas, the PepsiCo's, Crafts, Nestle, those kind of companies, and then the trade associations that help re represent them. And uh, not surprisingly, they've been contrary to a lot of public health advances that might help uh, improve public, the public's health. Uh, things like improve nutrition standards in schools, which they were quite opposed to in the beginning. Uh, they certainly don't want to change their marketing practices directed at children. Uh, they, there are some things that they're violently opposed to, like soda taxes and things like that. So my own, my own belief is that the industry um, will play ball only when they feel the bludgeon is about an inch from their head. Um, so somebody needs to come up behind them. There needs to be this bludgeon that can be bad publicity, it can be the threat of lawsuits, it can take many forms. But once they feel like there's a real threat, then they'll begin to take things seriously. And my sense is that they'll move ahead just enough to get out of the way of that particular bludgeon, and you can work with them in that space at that time. But then another bludgeon needs to get nearby in order to put pressure on them to move forward even, even more quickly. Um, and I think that's been played out now in a number of, of venues. So is the industry moving ahead? Yes, under some circumstances. For example, they've been called out for funding scientists, um, and Coca-Cola in particular got called out for doing that. So they've had to retrench. They've had to stop that funding of those scientists in particular, uh, and they've, re they've really reformulated the way they've started approaching this issue. So on that topic, they're doing really well, but they're still fighting like crazy against soda taxes through their, their trade association. So it's a lot of players doing a lot of different things at different times, but my own sense is that that bludgeon metaphor applies here. Uh, agreed, and you know, I, I see it as well. Um, Brianna, you work for the LA Food Policy Council. How have you seen changes in food procurement and food supply to the poor population of Los Angeles change as a result of um, what's going on within public health? 
It's a great question. Um, you know, LA sits at the heart of the largest food producing region in the country, um, yet it has the highest population of food insecure people in the country as well. That paradox is something that we at the LA Food Policy Council take really seriously. Um, and as a result, we've been trying to uplift policy that advances good food, food that is not only healthy, but sustainably produced and accessible to everyone and produced through fair labor. And so we've been able to uphold these standards through a good food procurement policy that we um, established in the city of Los Angeles and that was also adopted in the LA Unified School District. And it's like voting with your fork, but with 6,000 forks per day, because that's how many meals the LA Unified School District procures per day. And um, we've been able to change how the food industry um, operates, because it has to fit within these value categories around nutrition that were informed by AHA guidelines, as well as sustainability, as well as um, fair labor. And we've also created additional incentives for the food procurement strategies and policies of the um, various institutions institutions that adopt this policy to support local, smaller scale food producers that are oftentimes more oriented towards the values of, of nutrition and, and better food quality. Do you see that having any beneficial effect in terms of food insecurity, or does the problem just continue to grow? Well, a, a large portion of the food insecure children in Los Angeles are a part of the Los Angeles Unified School District. So the fact that the meals served there are of better quality and also support the local economy, I think is a win-win for both food insecurity and for supporting restructuring the food industry to be less inclined to support big multinational food corporations. Um, but in, but the, there are still, there's a still a great need for more comprehensive solutions that um, I think also address the, the awareness issue um, and also how to increase the, the knowledge of the fact that both food insecurity and obesity are two parts of the same problem. Well, as a pediatric endocrinologist taking care of obese children, I can tell you that when I see a kid who's on the National School Breakfast Program, usually that breakfast consists of a bowl of Fruit Loops and a glass of orange juice. You know? And the question is, is that better mm -hmm. than the alternative? In other words, are calories mm -hmm. more important than the quality and the nutrition of the food that's actually coming in? And we say that they don't have to be mutually exclusive, that you can have high quality food that is also nutritious and that's accessible. Um, and that's what the good food purchasing policy does. It supports both nutritious food as well as food that can be accessible to, to the students there. Well, Kristen, you've done a yeoman's job of being of ferreting out the specifics of you know, the uh, food industry tactics uh, over the past 40 years. Um, have you seen uh, any change in terms of what's going on. You've likened uh, the food industry uh, to uh, the tobacco industry in terms of uh, general strategies. Um, with all that pressure that public health is currently putting on the food industry, do you see any movement? Uh, I think Kelly did a nice job of, of uh, characterizing the strategies and the responses to things that bubble up in the media. Uh, and that's that's how they approach things. Uh, they will usually only act if they're they're forced to. Uh, but I've really come to realize I'm not actually studying the food industry as much as I'm studying the public relations industry. Uh, these trade groups hire public relations practitioners and consultants to develop their strategies and tactics. Uh, it's the same to what the tobacco industry did. So it's not necessarily tobacco industry tactics as much as as it is public relations tactics. And public relations isn't necessarily good or bad. I mean, the whole point is to create a favorable business environment for a company, which we would expect them to do. But when that favorable business environment harms the public interest, that's where we get into problems. Uh, and so I think that that's been the behavior of the sugar industry in particular. And I don't see them changing. So uh, with the added sugars label that we were all hoping was going to get implemented that's now been delayed, you know, I... Indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, is, I'm sure a direct result uh, of sugar industry and other trade groups lobbying. Uh, disclosure of added sugars and products is something the sugar industry has been against for 50 years or maybe 100 years. I mean, a very long time. Uh, so they're very skilled at, at kicking the can uh, down the road, and they will continue to do that for as long as we let them get away with it. Well, you did say something that sort of resonated in my head, and the talk about they market very well. So, you know, what's the difference between marketing and propaganda? So, marketing is using information to espouse your point of view. 
Propaganda is using disinformation to espouse your point of view. The difference is the truth. So when they tell the truth, it's marketing. When they don't, it's propaganda. And the question, I guess, for all of you is um, how does one deal with the propagandizing of the food industry when basically Congress and the Supreme Court have said that they have free speech? You know, there's, there's an awful lot of misinformation the companies put out. And you can just you don't have to look any further than the debates around the world and in the U.S. about soda taxes, where the, for a long time the companies were basically saying there was no relationship between sugar beverage consumption and risk for obesity and diabetes. And very much like the tobacco companies denied it well after the science on the issue was clear, the soda companies have done the same thing. But then, then they get called out for doing that, and it makes them look bad. So now they've stopped doing that, and they've recognized that excess soda consumption is a problem. So they've just changed the frame, where they say it's not use of the product that's creating a problem, it's overuse of the product, and therefore it's the problem of the consumers if they're consuming more than they ought to. Uh, but at the same time, of course, they're pushing consumers to drink as much as they possibly can. So I don't think the industry has much compunction about uh, presenting their point of view in a favorable way. That's, of course, what they do. But when it crosses the line and they're distorting the truth, then that gets to be a real problem. You know, they'll, they'll stir up fears. You know, uh, part of it's propaganda that it's, like with soda taxes, that it's Big Brother intervening in your life and calling the shots on your diet, and that ought to be a personal decision. Uh, that you may. Uh, they'll say that the taxes have a regressive effect and would have a negative impact on the community with no data to suggest that at all. And you could make the opposite argument for the benefits of something like a tax. So, you know, th th they, they have to sell as much product as, as they can. And if, if part of that becomes distorting the truth and doing things in a public relations way that really misleads consumers, I don't see that as, as anything that they're reluctant to do at all. And you can also look no, no further than the packaging and the labels on packaging that takes something that's not very healthy but makes it look healthy. Um, so there, there are just a million examples of this. Well, you know, the thing is in uh, uh, drugs, you have to prove efficacy. In food, you actually have to prove harm in order to get anybody to change. Um, and so, you know, we, we deal with this all the time. Um, you know, I, I liken this uh, uh, issue of food insecurity and obesity, which you know has put the public health community at loggerheads with each other because here's the obesity uh, contingent saying, you know, we've got to cut back on calories, and here we've got the food insecurity people saying we've got to, you know, provide calories. Uh, how do you see this ultimately playing out, and how do we get to? Um, direct our, um, shall we say, uh, our, our efforts uh, at the appropriate target instead of each other? I think that's a great question. Um, one of the partners that we work with is the Los Angeles Department of Public Health, and they recently released a report on food insecurity in Los Angeles and talked about the binge and star phenomenon with folks that are on CalFresh or the program formerly known as Food Stamps, SNAP nationally. Um, and it's this paradox that we see where, you know, SNAP participants binge and purchase the, the lowest cost but highest calorie food options, and then at the end of their um, benefit period, they don't have any money left and then they starve. And so it just perpetuates the, the, the symptom of obesity and other nutrition-related chronic diseases. Um, and so there is greater awareness of the fact that there needs to be more opportunities for people that are food insecure to be able to access um, healthier food options. And so one of the things that we've done is embarked on a campaign to get universal EBT access at farmers markets in the city of Los Angeles. Um, we adopted a policy that would require any new farmers market to have to accept EBT, as well as um, work, did a ground campaign working with each of the farmers markets to have them voluntarily comply with the policy. Uh, we increased from 54% um, EBT acceptance rate at farmers markets in the city of Los Angeles to 96% um, over the course of a year, just based on raising the awareness of how bringing federal dollars to support the local food economy can have, be a win-win for everyone involved, and also raise the visibility of the option to be able to use SNAP to purchase healthy food options. 
And there are programs out there like Market Match, which double the, the purchasing power of food insecure people to be able to purchase healthier food options. Um, and we're seeing the, the medical field play a greater interest in increasing the, the visibility of programs like this, as well as the food insecurity advocates trying to promote um, and encourage programs like this that can ensure that not only do food insecure people have access to calories, but to good calories that can sustain them and that can make them less inclined to, be, to acquire nutrition-related chronic disease. Yet, the uh, USDA uh, report that came out just a couple of months ago, which they had actually been holding on to for several years because it didn't look very good, mm -hmm. said that 40% of the uh, calories purchased on mm -hmm. SNAP were in soft drinks. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, I guess the question, and Kristen, please, you know, weigh in here, is how is the uh, Sugar Association and or the Soft Drink Association uh, you know, basically exerting this uh, effect over the USDA to specifically um, uh, promulgate this problem and what uh, measures are they uh, using to thwart our efforts? Uh, well, I haven't looked directly at exactly what's going on right now, but certainly government health officials are uh, what these trade groups look at as one of their key publics, and so they're setting out to understand who these government officials are in the USDA, and that they're people that they keep in regular contact with. And uh, anything that they're doing, the, the research that they're funding, uh, the statements that they're putting out, the communication documents that they're putting out are all aimed at people within these organizations um, to try and achieve a policy environment that favors them. So, of course, you know, uh, including high sugary products in, in SNAP and those types of things are, are to their benefit and I would expect that they've been using those same tactics that they've been using for many years and it will continue to go on and on. Well, The, the root of the influence is interesting because sometimes it, it could be direct influence over something like the USDA by the, the beverage companies or any other part of the food industry but it's a little more subtle than that because very often the revolving door applies here that especially in the current administration when people from industry are, are invited into important government roles and then of course they go back to industry after the government changes over and so there, there's a lot of a lot of hidden interactions around that but a lot of the influence comes through the elected leaders and the legislators who then put pressure on those regulatory agencies um, and the lobbyists are working hard on this kind of thing, and it's well, for sure their influence. Legislation always trumps administrative law, it's right? And if, if it works, this, I mean, just that issue you talked about about whether uh, people who are using beneficiaries of the SNAP program should be permitted to buy things like soda. Uh, the number I've heard most recently is the government buys four billion dollars worth of soda a year, and then people consume it through the SNAP program. Well, the food industry, the beverage industry, sure as heck doesn't want to give up $4 billion in sales. So you can imagine they're going to fight this in any way possible. Yeah. Well, um, let's talk about that revolving door. Uh, you know, it's been said that the uh, uh, USDA is just, you know, the arm of the food industry, the public arm of the food industry. The FDA is the public arm of the drug industry. And that revolving door continues. Uh, we've seen uh, members of the CDC um, leave or be fired because of their relationships with specific sugared beverage uh, 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 players. Um, we now have a CDC director who has specifically uh, said that Coca-Cola is one of the uh, CDC's primary partners and has taken Coca-Cola money in the past. Um, you know, what recourses do, you know, public health advocates like ourselves have in terms of, you know, sort of holding their feet to the fire to do right? Well, sunlight plays well. <laughs> you know, when, when people, like, well, for example, the CDC director, um, my understanding, I mean, the, the press that I read on this was that when she she was the uh, the health commissioner in Georgia. Georgia, she was before the state she, health commissioner. Georgia. Right, and and in that capacity, it had a some kind of a relationship with Coca Cola, which would make sense because Coca Cola well, was, was a, headquartered in Atlanta. They had a childhood obesity directive, and the obesity only got worse. Well, <laughs> the obesity's gotten worse in a lot of places. Yes. I'm not sure that that's there's <laughs> cause and effect there, but it's not surprising that if you're in Georgia, you're interacting with Coca Cola. But then when she became head of the CDC, then there was a lot of press attention to whether this relationship with Coca-Cola was going to continue. So I'd be kind of surprised if it, if it happens. 
going forward, it might, but I'd be a little bit surprised because, the, you know, they don't want that kind of bad publicity. Well, well you know, there were members of the CDC who actually wrote a letter to Tom Frieden before he uh, 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 resigned, uh, basically stating that they were very unhappy with the way the CDC was conducting business, that they were a little too chummy with uh, industry. So yeah, I guess I the question is, how does, how does one deal with that? Yeah, my sense is CDC is less, is going to be less uh, important in the, I mean, the CDC has a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, and I think they're not very subject to industry influence. The USDA, I think, is more so, and that's really where the where the impact is likely to occur. And there is a ton of interaction with industry. I mean, some of that has to happen, of course, because they're there to make American agriculture work better and thrive. So that interaction is clear. But when it comes in conflict with public health goals, then you've got problems. Well, you mentioned yourself, uh, and let's, let's talk about this issue of uh, subsidies and what it is we subsidize, because ultimately that is what translates into the cheapest food. So the things we subsidize in this country, corn, wheat, soy, sugar, all of which have been shown to have a problem one way or another in terms of our diet. I guess the question is, um, what does one do to try to turn that around, especially when... Um, uh, organizations like, for instance, the American Legislative Exchange Council is specifically put there to keep it the same. Yeah, well, in Los Angeles, there's a greater um, desire to promote urban agriculture and for people to grow their own food because they're tired of being dependent on this you know, industrial food complex that's been making them sick. Um, and or even smaller scale agriculture and currently the subsidies really support the larger scale monocrop agriculture that's creating a lot of the foods that are that are cheap but also that are making us sick so um, we've been trying to advocate for policy in the upcoming farm bill that supports more beginning small scale rancher and farmer programs that create more diverse um, food production and that also have sustainable agriculture practices that create more wholesome healthy food um, and it's going to be a struggle because we know that with this current administration, um, that's probably not going to be a priority and that a lot of the effort is going to be in just sustaining and maintaining the, the revenue and funding that's already there. Um, so it is a challenge and it was, we've been looking to other funding mechanisms to be able to support um, the types of agriculture that we'd like to see that we think can strengthen and transform the food system in Los Angeles. I agree. I think linking the, the farm bill with our dietary goals at the federal level is really important. Um, and the time period I'm sort of looking at right now related to sugar industry activities in the 1970s was the height of the consumer movement and Ralph Nader and consumer uh, public interest groups. And uh, one effort was, was to connect those things and really connect agricultural policy with nutrition policy. And, and the sugar industry was terrified of that happening. And so they worked very hard to keep those two things separate. So uh, the more that we can do to connect those, the better off we'll be. Well, does it make sense for uh, the USDA to be in charge of agriculture policy and HHS to be in charge of health? Um, in fact, there are 51 separate agencies that regulate the food industry. And most of the regulations actually are working at cross purposes and they don't necessarily talk to each other. Um, can any of you talk to the, uh, you know, the, the rationale for the USDA being in charge of our health and what we could do to try to streamline, uh, you know, uh, 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 the delivery of health, uh, not health care, but health uh, in America through food? In my sense is that the, the fact that USDA has nutrition policy under its purview as well as agriculture policy doesn't make sense when the two of those things don't align. Like was said earlier, that if you could align national nutrition priorities with agriculture priorities, then you'd, you'd be, everybody would be a lot better off, including the environment, not just to mention human health. So there are a lot of reasons to do that. But when you have big money involved, as you do with big agriculture, and then the public health, there's not really no money involved at all. It's just not a fair fight, and one trumps the other. So it would, I think it would be very helpful if nutrition policy were parked somewhere else in government, maybe with Health and Human Services, maybe with CDC. Well, I, you know, I've heard that many times, but I've got a very uh, you know, clear answer to that. 
and that is that the food industry grosses $1.46 trillion a year in this country, of which $657 billion is gross profit. So that's a gross profit margin of 45%. The next highest industry is Big Pharma at 18%. So this is their juggernaut. This, you know, I understand why they don't want to let go. But here's the problem. Healthcare in America costs $3.2 trillion, of which 75% is chronic metabolic disease, of which 75% of that is preventable if we could go back to 1970 rates, and the federal government pays for 65% of all health care delivered in the United States. So when you do the math on that, it turns out that we are spending more on the health care cleaning up the food industry's mess than they are making in profit. That is unsustainable. The problem is everyone's only looking at the positive side of the ledger. How much money can we make? And the you know, U.S. government looks at the, the tariffs and the money that's brought in through exports but the fact of the matter is the health care debacle, which falls right in their lap, ultimately costs them way more. So how do we get people to focus on the negative side of the ledger instead of the positive? Well, and in your calculations, you're not even including the environmental consequences. Oh, absolutely. Of the, of the Let's add those in. <laughs> which would make it even worse. Sure. You know, as a society, we're starting to think about uh, t taking the externalities of a, a business transaction you know, somebody selling something and somebody buying that thing, um, and, and then putting those into the price of the, the, the sales. So, for example, with cars, if, if you have a gas guzzler, you might have to pay more because of gas guzzler taxes. Um, the, the government policy could just eat that and it could get passed along to consumers somehow, but it gets embedded in the price and that affects people's purchasing power. So, if the externalities of food production and consumption could be actually borne by the people involved in the financial transaction. That is, we would pay more for meat, for example, because of both the health consequences and the environmental consequences of producing it. Then you could help shift around consumption patterns in ways that would probably better line up with public health priorities. Um, but and so there's a little bit of thinking about that with you know carbon taxes and things like that. So I think we're inching closer to that, but we're not close enough to it now. Well, I'll throw a, a, another monkey uh, a wrench into the, the, the mix. Um, why don't we just get rid of food subsidies entirely? Because all they do is distort the market. The Giannini Foundation at UC Berkeley actually modeled what food would look like. Everyone says, well, food prices would go up. Actually, food prices would stay exactly the same, except for two crops, corn and sugar. Right, but what would you do if, if subsidies were actually improving public health? which could theoretically be done. It could be done. I mean, you could subsidize radishes or broccoli, um, absolutely. Um, and you could subsidize the, the good food and tax the bad. Um, you could subsidize the water and tax the soda and have the uh, uh, tax pay for the subsidy, you know, differential subsidization, yoking them together. Um, you know, the question is, who's listening? How do you get these ideas up to a level where someone... Um, actually can do something about it. This really sounds like something that Congress would have to take on. And how do you do that when they're paid off? I would say I think that uh, health professionals have a major role to play here. And uh, one thing that I am coming to learn is that the food industry has really targeted health professionals as a key public uh, in trying to uh, disengage them from the political process. And I think the more that health professionals understand that and know that they can have an influential role in making these changes, maybe we'll get some leverage on our side. I think there's also a role that local communities can play in also trying to curb behavior through taxes or subsidies. Um, sugar sweetened beverage taxes, there was one that was um, adopted in Berkeley not long ago, and there's some stakeholders in Los Angeles who are also considering one as well. Um, we've seen the positive impacts that it's had in both Berkeley and in Mexico, and I think that having those examples to look to to be able to encourage legislators and also skeptics in the community about the potential that this can have, I think is helping us to be able to make it a more viable option. Yet, Chicago repealed right. their tax before they even uh, had it uh, 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 enacted. Exactly. So, uh, you know, the, the food industry is alive and well. Definitely. <laughs> and um, they will continue to be a, uh, uh, a formidable force for, 
years to come. But at the same time, Chicago repealed their tax just today. Thailand passed the tax on sugared beverages. All right. So I, I think that, you know, no, nothing's a straight line. So you've got good progress with things like soda taxes, but there will be setbacks here and there. But I think overall the trajectory is very positive. Well, let's uh, end the trajectory now. Uh, it is 3.30. Our time is up. I hope you have enjoyed this Facebook Live chat with, um, shall we say, giants of the field, um, Kelly Brownell, uh, Brianna Hawkins, Chris Carnes, and myself, Rob Lustig. And with that, I bid you adieu and good eating. <laughs>